Thank you. You know, um, this year, as we start, you know, every year we probably do resolutions, right? What's you already going to be doing for this year? And talking to the Lord, I told him I'm going to be a little bit more open to what he has to say and what he wants to do and not push it off to the side or think too much about it. Just, just go, kind of like what it used to. <laughs> um, the reason why I'm talking about this um, is I was sitting there where I worship and I feel like the Lord has somebody on his heart today. Some, something has happened with someone here, maybe a great injustice. And um, you've been crying out to the Lord to, um, to basically to get in your corner and be your advocate. And I just want to, I, I don't know if that's here for somebody. Maybe it's somebody online. But the Lord's in your corner, and uh, he doesn't like what happened to you. He doesn't like what was the things that you've been accused of. And if that's you, I just want you to know that the Lord is going to be working things out. And it hurt him just as much as it hurt you. And he's going to be your advocate. If that's anybody here, let us know when we come for prayer time. Amen? Amen. All right. I just feel his heart on this one, guys. <sighs> for his people. All right. Well, um, as mentioned, I'm Pastor Mike and uh, one of the pastors here. And today I want to be talking about an everlasting covenant. Now, you know, there's been a lot of things written about the covenant. And, you know, I, I got to admit, I don't really know too much about it other than what we hear in church and messages and things from the pulpit and things online that you read, and it's really, really important to kind of go through it and read, and I did a lot of studying this week about the covenant, and I just want to kind of share some things that's been on my heart that maybe I've had wondering what this is about, what that's about, and in my studies today, I'm hoping that I, I uh, give you a viewpoint of maybe some of the, the covenants, because we're going to learn there's a couple of covenants in the, in the Bible. So my foundational scripture is from Hebrews 8, 6. And it says this, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Amen, Lord. So recently, Pastor Bill was actually talking about this. A couple of sermons ago, he mentioned the covenant, and I had really started thinking about it or looking into it. And uh, it was really it was really kind of cool for me when he started talking about the covenants, and it really made me to go, okay, Lord, I think you want us to maybe this year is to kind of understand what it is, the covenant, and what we walk in. Because many times, guys, we get, we're in, as Pastor Bill was talking earlier, you know, it, it's amazing that sometimes we don't walk in these realities that we have, that God has said in our word. We're still kind of back somewhere. Some of the songs that we're talking about, we're going forward. This is a new day. Goodbye to the past. We're into what we're going to be learning today or what the Lord has for us today. But he was talking about the covenant. That really sparked my interest. I have for many years just kind of glossed over this term and really have had many questions on how they work, what they did, and how are they formed, and what was the end result of them. Again, I'm a process guy, so I always like to say, hey, if we're going to do something, if we're in something, I want to know how I got into it, what's going to go on with when I'm in it, and what's going to be the end result, or what was the, the thing that happens because of that. Does, does that make sense? I'm not, that's my brain, how it works. If you think of the Bible in a covenantial, covenantial way, it is a written history of God's covenant journey with mankind. If you read throughout the scriptures, guys, from Genesis all the way to Revelations, we're going to uncover some covenants and what was going on in those. And it's, it's really, it was really eye-opening to me. The Greek word is diate, usually translated covenant in English versions of the Bible, is a legal term denoting a formal and legally binding declaration of benefits to be given by one party to another without any conditions attached. That's what, that's what we see if you go into the, the dictionary. 
There have been thousands of sermons written over the years and many list, listened to online and, and by other means. And I'm going to see if I can help you if you had any questions that I have had rolling around in my head. So hopefully, I hope, when I'm trying to figure something out, I try to figure it out. Hopefully somebody had those same questions. You know, every, questions are not bad to ask when you're asking God, hey, can you kind of help me with this one? He, he's okay with that. In my studies, I've seen that there are at least five covenants in the Bible. And I'm going to do my best to touch on them with the time that I have today. The first one is the Noahic covenant. That's with Noah. The second is the Abrahamic covenant. And the third one is the Mosaic covenant. The fourth is the Davidic covenant. And lastly, the new covenant in which we are a part of today. This is important to know because many of us, when we think or hear about the old covenant, we are quick to say that we're no longer under that. And that is 100% true. So that is 100% true. But even though the Old Covenant is in the Old Testament, there are others. Israel lived under the Old Covenant for 1,300 years according to a biblical time span. And that means between Genesis and Exodus, that history was about 2,800 years. What kind of covenant were they under? You know, it's really interesting to me that God would use, you know, covenant is not something that God started. Okay? There in, if you look back in the Old in the old. Uh, um, times the countries, they had, they had had these covenants established. It's really interesting to me that God would use some of those imageries that things were going on at that culture at that time and bring a covenant so people would understand because there was already stuff going on. Covenants are being made between parties, between nations, between peoples. And he used those things that were already there to, to do that with him. So that was interesting to me. I thought he was the one that created it. And no, I mean, Green the Sea was really cool. Has, any, has anyone ever asked other than me, why did God do things in the Old Testament that seemed cruel or reactionary? You know, I, I, I struggle with this for a long time because we read about that God is the same as today, yesterday, today, and forever. And I read this Old Testament, or I read the Old, you know, the Old Testament in the Bible, and I see all these things, and I'm like, man, God, was he just crazy? Or what was going on? But as the more I kind of study this, I kind of seen that God is this, has been the same. He's tried to be the loving God to his people through all through the ages. And there was maybe because of covenants, there were some things that he, he did because of he had to keep his part of the, of the covenant going on. So it really became eye-opening to me because, you know, even, even uh, I was reading Stephen, famous atheist Stephen Dawkins once wrote that the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. <laughs> Jealous. He's proud of himself. He's petty, unjust, unforgiving, a control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty. <laughs> I'm going to just stop reading this. He just said a lot of things that he believed this God, who God is. And, you know, for, for many of us, it's hard to answer somebody like that because you just, you know, you're reading the Bible and you're reading and you're looking at the Old Testament and you're reading who he is now or what we hear or what, we, what we've been taught. And it's hard to answer someone and go, oh, well, yeah, maybe he wasn't, but maybe like I said, I'm going to hopefully I uncover some stuff or show some stuff to you guys. But he was always the same. He just, we're going to learn, okay? I do not believe that the God of the Old Testament is any different than the God of the New Testament. For it is written in Hebrews 13.8 that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the God of love and has always been. And maybe, just maybe, it's because of the covenants that he got into men that some of the things happened like they did. Do you know that every covenant God entered to, with man, he's always kept his end of the union or agreement. God's always kept up his end. He always has, which is pretty eye-opening for me. Because, you know, we just, oh, I'm in the covenant, but, yeah, I'm some, we're going to learn some more. Sir. In the ancient Near, Near East, the countries that derive from the cradle of civilization, it's widely known that there's three types of covenants. And, and we in the West may not have heard about these. They were commonly created between two parties. And I'm going to tell you what the three are. They're grant covenants, kinship covenants, and vassal covenants. I don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to just kind of let you know a little bit. The grant covenant is when a king decided to honor and bless a faithful servant or a lesser king. He would establish a grant covenant. A grant covenant was the best type of covenant because it came with no strings attached. Pretty amazing. It was unconditional and didn't require obedience on the part of the receiver. It was a generous overflow of love and grace poured out of the ruler's heart upon the one receiving the grant covenant. 
I'd say that's the one I'd like to be in, just from the top. From reading, that's the one I want to be in. The next one was a kinship covenant. It's when two equal parties decided to enter into the covenant together, such as a military alliance or even in a marriage. And this was known as a kinship covenant. The covenant came with certain obligations, which both parties would uphold similar to exchanging of the vows and like a marriage ceremony. So we're, we have a little understanding of that one, the kinship covenant, because we see that in, 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 a, in a marriage. The last one or the third one that I was reading about was a vassal covenant. And uh, during the times of war, a king may have decided to spare the enemies, nations, women, children, and the elderly, elderly so he could continue to exact labor and tax money from them for years to come to keep them alive. The king will establish, establish a, a vassal covenant, which, is a heavy, was, which was the heaviest covenant to bear the conditions of the vassal covenant were seemingly endless. So that doesn't sound too, too nice, right? <laughs> um, with the stipulation that the lesser party, if he did not uphold their end of the deal, the king would be... Really, he could he could kill them. They didn't handle they didn't part of they didn't handle their part of the end or their part of the the they had that part. And they could they could kill him. So to understand the different covenants, this is a pretty cool guideline to help us understand what type of covenants are in effect during the timelines when we're reading about them. It's really started to open up for me now that I've read this. When the two parties got into these agreements, it was customary from time to time for them to come together and see if the agreements are working out, meaning they come together, and let's, let's kind of look at all this, and let's see how we both parties are, are, are handling, let's see if we're handling each part of our ends that we decided as we got into this. Among the Old Testament covenants, we find all three types of covenants. God covenant with Noah, Abraham, and David were all grant covenants. You guys remember what the grant covenant was? Really one that we, that's, that's really cool to get into. Um, and Moses' covenant started as a grant covenant, then it went to a kinship, and then it ended in as a vassal covenant. So we're going to touch a little bit about that. In Noah's covenant, we read in Genesis 6, 18, it says, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. Later on in Genesis 9, 11, God says, Thus I establish my covenant with you, never again shall I all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Notice how there's no conditions on the promise that he's establishing. He's basically just saying, this is what I'm going to do. You guys, this is, this is just something that I'm going to do for you. There's nothing that you have to do. Now, you could argue, well, we made the boat, we got into it, and we, we did our part of it. But, you know, they didn't really have to do that. God let it out there. Noah built the boat. So we quickly want to say, well, we had to do something to get that. And that's not what I'm reading here. A brief look at Abraham's covenant. We see that God tells him that he will make a great nation. He will make Abraham's name great and bless those who bless him. And then he says, I will bless all people on the earth because of you. Pretty cool covenant he's getting into there. And if you think about it, the one thing we know about Abraham, he is a man of faith. He had faith to leave his land faith to believe in a God he really didn't know, and faith to sacrifice the things that meant a lot to him in order to follow God. That's kind of a cool pattern. I don't know if you got, got that. That's something to jot down. We really, really need something that we wish we were more like that. Let us take a brief look at Moses' covenant. If you think about it now, knowing what we've learned, it starts off as a grant covenant. God offers Moses and Israel this covenant. I'm going to read this in Exodus 19. Verses 5 through 6. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people from all the earth, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And there they moved, and then they moved to the confirmation. So God basically tells Moses, here's what I want to do with the people. So they moved to, for the confirmation of the covenant. The covenant but the people are overwhelmed with the presence of God. We were to be there, the presence of God. And we, we, we experience it a lot, but we're going to see that more and more. And I hope we're not like what these people did. But this, this good thing about the Bible, we get to read and see how maybe to change those. So in fear, they begged Moses to, 
be a go-between them and God. Basically, they turned down his offer. God, I mean, Moses, you go talk to God for us. We're, we're, we're so afraid, right? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, as I read this, I see us. I see sometimes the church. I see myself. You know, God, I'd rather go get a word from somebody instead of spending time with you, instead of meeting with you. And, and I don't know if I want to get in your presence, Lord, but we are always looking for somebody else to be a go-between. What if we were those people that wanted to just be in God's presence and not look for the go-between? Something to think about. So God, in his loving manner, again, because he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, comes to them with a redrafted proposal. Israel's response is, we are good where we, where we are with you, God. We're, we're good. We, we, we're all right. We, we're, we're okay. We're, that's all right. Tell Moses do whatever he does, whatever he says, whatever you want to tell him, we'll listen. And that's in Deuteronomy 5.25. You guys can go back and read that. Exodus 20, also 18 to 19. This is their response to them. It's kind of surprising to me now that I'm reading it, but it's really jumping out to me. After this, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, and they are now in a kinship covenant. Now this kind of covenant is punishable by death, and the people are failing miser- miserably in the desert. Maybe that's why God wants to kill them. I don't know. <laughs> they're not, they're not, they're not uh, kind of following their end of the deal, right? So, hey, maybe. But he loves his people. But he continues much like us today. No matter, sometimes we don't follow, sometimes we fail miserably, but he loves us. Just like he loved them back then. And he really didn't want to do what he had to do, but this is what, this is what, he, this is what he did. So, so then um, so Moses then dies, and the kinship covenant can now be over because one partner has died. And that's really interesting. That's a, that's a fact. In, in a, when a covenant, a covenant is only effect, in effect, while the other person who's representing the other side is alive. Once that person is dead or dies or there's no more people left at that, that covenant is over. So it's very, very interesting that uh, we see when Moses dies, he's basically kind of redrafted again because he's going to start up with um, Joshua. So God amends the covenant again with Joshua and begins to lead Israel to a vassal covenant. And, you know, you can go read Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy right? You guys can read De- Deuteronomy tonight where it says, if you do this, this will be this. Basically laying out his conditions. And if you do this, you'll be blessed. If you don't, you see all this stuff. So I don't believe that was in the heart of God to do, want to do that, but that's what he needed to do because of where the people were at that time. This is the old covenant and the law that the New Re- Testament refers to. God had offered his people a grant covenant. They chose a kinship and then failed to uphold their end. So now in his mercy, God downgrades them to a vassal covenant, which we should, should be able to clearly see that this is a form of covenant that was never in his heart for his people. He just wanted to be their God, right? All throughout the Old Testament, even today, he just wants to be their God. He just wants to be our God. The old covenant is now is ended, and based on my studies, this is not God's heart. In fact, it veiled who he really wanted to be to them. Really, really interesting as I've been reading and through this new perspective. I, maybe maybe you guys have already had this. I haven't. But in 2 Samuel, we are now introduced to David's covenant, which is with God. We see a heart of a man sold out to God. Sometimes the church concentrates on his failures, and it's something that we should take note. There were some things that David didn't do. But of course, we get to see that David, when he goes to his heart for the Lord, he goes to Nathan because he believes the ark should not be in a tent but in a magnificent place. God had never required that or asked for it. But God tells Nathan to tell David, do whatever is in your heart. Guys, what is in our heart to do for the Lord? Love to somebody. That, you know, and he's still saying that now. There's many of us that want to do some amazing stuff for the Lord. And he's going to say, do whatever's in your heart. If you're going to do it unto me, do it. I believe because David has such an honor for God. And if you think about, he was asking for something that was not yet given. He was asking, if you go back through and leave in David, he was asking for a clean heart and that we would, that the Holy Spirit would not be taken away from him. And I believe that that was something that he's, God couldn't give to him because that was going to be something that he was going to give to us. But such a heart that God, that David had for God, that he was asking for something that he couldn't give it to him yet because that's something that we walk in now. 
the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and a clean heart. And so I, as I was reading it, I just really spoke to me. I was wondering, why is God, why do you love David so much? That could be a reason. Maybe it's just me, but that's, that's what I was reading as I picked out. 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 17. This is a New American Standard uh, Bible I took out. Even from the day that I appointed judges over you, my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies, the Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are finished and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up a descendant after you who will come from you, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever, and I will be a father to him, and he will be my son. I think that's a, a covenant. If you read about it, basically God's, I'm offering you this, David, or I'm going to tell you it's, it is a grant covenant because of who you are, how much you love me. This is what I'm going to do because of you. And I'll keep reading. And when he does wrong, I will discipline him with a rod of men and with strokes of sons of mankind. But my favor shall not depart with him as I took it from Saul when I removed from for you. Your house and your kingdom will shall endure before me forever. Your throne will be established forever and in accordance with all these words and all the visions. So Nathan spoke to David. Go back and read that, guys. And then read his response. David receives God's promise with humility. And we know that because if you read response, and that's in 2 Samuel 7, 18 through 29, we see that he understands he just entered into a covenant promise. What type of that covenant, guys? Grant. Remember? It's a grant. So I spent a little time in the different covenants today because I wanted us to see the magnitude of the covenant we walk in today with God. As mentioned, this covenant is built on better promises. The New Testament uses several metaphors to make comparisons between the old and the new covenant. I'm just going to use a couple of them. There's a lot of them in my studies, but I'm going to use a couple of them. A new priesthood. That was what was promised in the, in the new covenant. Hebrews 7.12 says it this way. For the priesthood being changed of, necessar- of, necess- of necessity, there is also a change of the law. So we see this. Jesus is our new high priest, and he's not, from, he's not a Levite. How many of you guys know that? So the old covenant that was led by the Levites, you know, once that is over with, You had to be a Levite to keep that thing going, right? But we know that Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. So that priesthood is over with because Jesus is now our our, our priest, our high priest. And he's under another, he's under another family. He's come from the, he's a lion from the tribe of Judah. So because of that, we know that that covenant is over. And now we're in a new one. The new tabernacle, Hebrews 8 2 says it this way, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. That's amazing. That stuck out to me. This is speaking of Jesus ministering into a superior temple. The old covenant was based on the obedience of law and the new covenant is written on the hearts and minds of God's people. Hebrews 8.10 says it this way, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house when I read earlier. The house of Israel, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them in their heart, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Could it be, could it be that the new temple of God is not some other temple? You know, I'm always reading about, oh, Jerusalem's waiting for the third temple, and then all that, and then all this will happen. Guys, I'm eschatology. I don't try to figure out what's going on because I want to establish God's kingdom on the earth now. I'm not waiting for a sign. I, I read this in the Bible that we're in it today, and that's how I read it. I may be flawed, but I'm not waiting for something to happen, something up somewhere else. If this happens and we're in this and everything's great, no. I don't have the, uh, uh, um, <laughs> tell my wife all this, the escape pod mentality. I'm here. We're here to establish his kingdom on the earth. We're here to rule and reign here and to bring people to the saving grace of Jesus Christ to know them, and if you're looking to, hey, the sweet by and by, we should be all excited that we're all going to go to heaven. That's an amazing thing, but we have some work to be done here, and we shouldn't be thinking about leaving. There's too many people here that don't know about who God is and what he can do in their life. 
So I don't, I'm not in eschatology and what's going to happen there. I'm, more, I'm about what's going on now. So this is really opening up my, my mind as I'm reading this. Could this be that we are the new temple of God and not some other temple that God, you know, that man's waiting for us to build on the other part of the world? It's an amazing thought. I don't know. It might be too much, but I'm still chewing on this. A new glory. 2 Corinthians 3, 7 says this. In the first part of the verse, it says, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, we know that the Old Testament, the Old, excuse me, the Old Covenant was a glorious one, okay? No doubt about it. Or it came with glory. When Moses came down from the mountain, he covered or veiled his face for two reasons. The people were afraid to look upon him in a time because they didn't. So they were afraid to look at him. He comes down with a veil because he's shining and the Lord's presence is on him. And so that was one reason that he did that. The other reason, I believe, because he saw it was going to fade. That was going to be a fading glory because we were going to go into something else. And so he kept it veiled so that, for one, to shield the people because they were afraid of it. And the other, other part of it, it was going to be going away. And maybe he didn't want them to know. Maybe he didn't want them to know that God's heart was, this is not what he really wanted for them. And so he was trying to protect the people. I don't know. I keep reading. I keep reading and I'm still chewing on this one. The veil of the old covenant blocked the glory from the time of Moses until the time of Christ. It's a crazy, it's a crazy thought, right? 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, but we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. In Christ's new covenant, we have an ever-increasing glory, unveiled faces. Instead of hiding the glory, we now reflect God's glory in an ever-increasing manner. This is what I keep reading. It's, ever, it's going to be ever-increasing, guys. It's not going to fade away because be us being in a new covenant, there's, there's a new thing. There's new things that are going on. A new wineskin. This is another one I picked out. If you think about it, the new wine, we're kind of singing about that earlier, or the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit cannot be poured into old wineskins or an old covenant. Can't pour in the new, what God wants to do on earth with old mindsets. It will burst. It will not be able to handle it. And nothing will be able to be kept in it. It will get all poured out. So did you know that Jewish historian Josephus, Josephus stated that the temple was seen as a representation of the universe and the phrase heaven and earth was an idiom referring to the Jewish temple. Jesus spoke about three divisions in the, in the, in the temple. Well, one was land, sea, and heaven. I won't get in the way, but that's really cool. When Jesus spoke at the end of heaven and earth, his hearers would have heard his words as a prophecy of the destruction of the temple or, in other words, the end of the law. Now, we know in 70 AD, guys, uh, the temple was burned. The temple, Jesus talked about this in Matthew. These things are happening. I don't think it was in the future. I think it happened back then. And once the, old, once the temple was destroyed, that there's no way, so that there's no priest. They can't be in the temple no more. They can't uphold the law. They can't do any of those stuff. So now it becomes over. And Jesus talked about that. He was, and he was using this uh, in, in, in the scripture. I believe he was saying it's over with. Once that happens, it's over. We're now in a new covenant. Matthew 5 says, uh, 15 through 17, did you, do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will no, no means pass from the law till it's fulfilled. Also further down, Matthew around chapter 24, uh, verses 20, 34, 35, it's written, and Bill talked about this. Surely I say you, this generation will no means pass till all these things pay, pay, all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. Heaven and earth is what? The temple. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words by no means will pass away. So the, the law is over. The old covenant with Moses is over. We are now in a new covenant. The old covenant will pass away, but any words from Jesus will be eternal and life-giving. 
All right, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind down here. Jesus fulfilled every covenant that was made through the whole Bible. You know, he said, I didn't come to, I didn't come to abolish it. I didn't come to, he came to fulfill it, and I'm going to just kind of go through it. He was the living water that floods the earth, not to destroy it, but to bring everlasting life. He was the offering of Abraham who trusted Yahweh even to the point of death and became a blessing to all nations. He is the greater Moses leading us all out of bondage. And he is the obedient Israelite who perfectly followed the laws of God. He is the royal son of David who inaugurated God's kingdom in this life, in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection. And now sits at God's right hand forever reigning as the one true king. So he fulfilled all the covenants. Jesus was the one who fulfilled them all. That's how he fulfilled them all, guys. If you ever, I've always tried to make this distinction. How, is he, how did he fulfill it? But this is how he, this is, I think. Jesus predicted, Jesus perfectly succeeded at every point where humanity, humanity failed. He is the guarantor, guarantor and mediator of a new and better covenant. The final covenant will never be broken because God of his ending love, his unending love for his people, he sent his son as a man, and now the covenant is between father and son. You think you can break that? You think either one of those big father and son are going to break their, their part of it? So it's not like when, when God made those covenants with all the people, a lot of times they didn't hold up their end. But what an amazing uh, thing, a thought that God decided, I'm going to send my son. I tell you what, Jesus, I'm going to send you back to earth as a man. And then when you get there, we're going to do all the stuff we talked about. And the last thing we're going to do, we're going to set up a new covenant. And you know what? You're going to be on one side, and I'm going to be on the other side. And I know you're going to hold up your end, and I'm, I'm going to hold up my end. So this thing will never get broken. And, guys, that's what we walk in today. I don't know if y'all thought about it. Amen. The final covenant will never be broken because I said this. But um, so we are joint heirs to this throne and we are included in this amazing covenant that is everlasting. Now, guys, I hope I, I hope I helped you a little bit. Uh, I know I didn't have a whole lot of time and um, it's been a really eye opening to me of the covenant that we walk in. I probably didn't do it justice, but maybe I'll do a, another part at some point. But I hope you guys understand that the covenant we walk in is such an amazing thing, such an amazing part, and it can never be broken. It can never be broken. It's not going to, you know, there's not somebody who's not going to keep up our end. Jesus is keeping up our, his end, his, and his end is in us. And we're going to do all our best to, to do what he asks, just like I was talking about earlier. This is going to be a year, guys. God's going to ask us to do things. God's going to ask his church to do things because we want to see his covenant ever expand, his, his kingdom ever expanding, and I'm excited for what God's going to do through Life Spring in 2023. Amen? Amen.